As we come to your word, we want to see that more clearly. We want to see how your glory, your grace has been shown to us in a way that should leave us speechless, leave us challenged, but at the same time leave us encouraged. So we walk out of here excited to serve the God that we serve. So I pray that you would bless this time. Open our eyes, the eyes of our hearts, to see your glory through your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, good morning again. My name is Micah Page. For those of you who don't know me, I'm the worship pastor here. I've been here for three and a half months, and it has been a, a great and encouraging time in a lot of ways. One thing that has not been so encouraging has been our, our house sale process, and uh, some of you know the troubles that we've gone through with that. We had a, a sale in place, and then it fell through uh, less than a week before we were supposed to sign. Um, and so we're like, okay, we don't know what you're doing, God. But then uh, we just, this last weekend, got to finalize another sale. So we are pending. And uh, the house that we had picked out waited for us. So we are expected to move to Tualatin uh, August 15th. So that is a praise. I thank you, those of you who have been praying for us in that. Um, we are excited to be up here full time. Right now, I'm still commuting up Tuesday, Wednesday, and then coming up for Sundays. And it is uh, great to be here, um, but it is taxing as well. So your prayers all the way until we have keys in hand would be much appreciated. <laughs> you, once one falls through, I guess you never really trust one again, I guess. But um, at least we can trust God. So we are in a series called The Church, The Hope of the World. Um, before we get into that, I thought I'd give you a little more background information on who I am. Uh, it's okay to listen to, to strangers if you don't know me, but just to give you a little bit of background of who we are and then lead into our message, I'd like to share with you a little bit about uh, me and my wife, Christy. She is seated up here, uh, front right there. Um, we met in 2007. Um, back when, okay, I used to make fun of people who met online, but we met through Facebook when it was only for college students, so a little more coolness, I guess, I don't know. Um, but yeah, she did a search for Baptist at the U of O, and I was one of like eight people that showed up. So there were either not many Baptists there or they didn't claim to be Baptists, I don't know. Um, but fortunately I did because uh, I came to my... I was preparing for youth group and came to my inbox and I was like, whoa, a girl. <laughs> she messaged me. All right. And uh, fortunately, I played it cool. I just sent her back something little. I think it was something like, hey, you're Baptist. That's kind of cool. Um, something basically like that. I was like, oh, we'll see how this goes. She's out of my league. And uh, 12 months later, we were married. So that's all right. That's all right with me. However it happens. So there we are. Dating, uh, that was a wonderful year. Met in January of 2007. We were married December 15th of 2007. So 2007 is the year of Christy and Micah in my mind. In fact, it's hard to think of anything else in that year uh, without thinking of it in reference to our time of dating. That's just, that was the primary focus, is this new relationship that I had and that I was thankful for and there's just, just extra joy uh, hopefully it was this way for you if you're married or engaged, uh, of just being with the person that uh, you want to spend uh, the rest of your life with. Um, and uh, oh, I look around and a lot of people are smiling, kind of laughing a little bit. We all like weddings. Uh, you may not like to go to weddings. I don't know, maybe you've gone to too many. Maybe they're too long or boring. But I think we all deep down actually like a good wedding because it reveals some things that we cherish as humans. Um, a wedding, people getting married, reveals, well, uh, let me hear from you guys. What do you like about a wedding? You can respond. You can talk. <laughs> Inseparable. Yes, a, con a bond, a connection. That is great. What else? Joy, commitment. Wonderful. That's exactly right. I'm glad nobody said flowers. I mean, they're, they're nice, but there is much deeper things to cherish through a wedding than, than just the flowers, um, though the flowers are great. Um, yes, a wedding. They're joyful events. We all love it when relationships actually work, and that's what a marriage uh, implies. It should reveal, uh, ideally, affection, commitment, intimacy, and true unity. 
Additionally, weddings have promise for the future. You don't get married just for that day, right? You get married in order to live, as the, the famous fairy tale ending goes, uh, to live happily ever after, right? It is uh, a leading up, a culmination of this process to, to unite, to be uh, drawn together uh, inseparably, ideally. Unfortunately, that picture has been uh, tainted, uh, polluted by sin, and we all are guilty in some way of not respecting the relationship we have uh, with our spouse um, if we are, are uh, blessed to be married. Um, but sometimes you have to look at culture and uh, kind of do a forehead slap. Uh, there's now a term uh, called bridezilla. How many are familiar with that term? Yeah. That is uh, when the bride basically, in wanting the, the wedding to be perfect, uh, basically turns into a monster. So here is one example, an extreme example, mind you, that I found online. There are many on there to search for if you want to be discouraged. You can go look at those. My college roommate asked me to be a bridesmaid in her wedding. I agreed. Then the bridesmaid dress she picked out for me was $2,400. 2400 that was. I couldn't afford it and gently told her so. I found a pattern for a similar dress and fabric that was the same color and type. So I asked her if it was okay if I made a similar dress or they could go shopping together and find something in her budget. All the bridesmaids were going to be wearing the same color but they were different dresses so she wouldn't have stuck out like a sore thumb. But the bride cussed her out, told her she was ruining her wedding, that her vision for her wedding required her to wear that dress and couldn't she just get a credit card to charge the dress on? When, I, when she told her no, the bride cut all contact with this uh, potential bridesmaid, claiming that if it was true, that if she was a true friend, she would make the finances work, and they've never spoken again. The bride had been like a sister to this woman up until that point. Obviously, there's some problems with marriages uh, today. There are some good examples, and I hope yours, your story is like that. Um, but we have to remember when we come to Scripture, uh, this, the reason I bring this all up, this series, this uh, episode in our series of, of sermons is, is focused on the bride of Christ. If we have to understand the church, the hope of the world, we need to understand the terms the Bible applies to the church. And one of those terms is the bride of Christ. And when we come to it, we need to be sure to strip away the, the so to speak, soiled vision we have uh, of some marriages. And so try to come to this with an ideal idea, uh, view of what would the perfect marriage be? And that's a better picture of what the bride of Christ, uh, what the marriage uh, to the lamb, to Christ at the end of the times will be like. Um, one main difference. First, when the bride of Christ is presented to the bridegroom in the end times, the church presented to Christ, sin is no longer an issue. So it has been eradicated at that point. Pride, lust, deception, envy, anger, uh, all those things will be removed. That is good news. Second, very key point. The marriage at the end of, the, of Scripture in Revelation between uh, the church and Christ glorifies not the bride. It is usually, from my experience, that marriages today uh, are termed the bride's day. The bride is the focus, Right? In this marriage, that is not the case. The glory goes to Christ. God the Father, what he has done through Christ. And even though the bride is glorious in, uh, in how she's presented, it is because of what God has done for her. And we're going to see that. But just remember, the glory goes to God fully. To look at this, we are going to go to the beginning of the Bible and the end of the Bible and make a stop along the way. So the marriage picture that we have with us in Scripture starts at creation. The first human, human relationship is a marriage, Adam and Eve. The last relationship that we will experience is equated with a marriage, likened to a marriage, or more appropriately, our idea of marriage is likened to what the end result will be, Christ and his church. And in the middle, we have the fall and God's plan of redemption to bring us to that point of being able to unite us with Christ. And there's a lot of work to be done. If you know the depths of your own heart, you know that God has his work cut out for him, of course. So let's start. Let's get into scripture. We're going to turn to Genesis chapter 2. 
And in the Bible underneath the seat in front of you, uh, it is on page three, way at the beginning. We're going to read quite a bit, so either turn to it in your phone or turn to it in the Bible in front of you, uh, because it's important to be following along uh, in in this message. So, Genesis 2, starting at verse 15. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, You are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will certainly die. The Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Man was already in relationship to God, but God gave him another relationship. He said it was good for him to have relationship, um, another human to have relationship with. And we'll see why when we look later. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the wild animals and all the birds in the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds in the sky, and all the wild animals. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And it has been pointed out to me that Scripture says that man fell into a deep sleep, and it never says he ever awoke. Little humor, I'm sorry. Here we go. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. The man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called a woman, for she was taken out of man. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. Adam and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. So we see in these verses here, the first, again, the first human relationship is a marriage. We know that later they had children. We second see from verse 25, God's version of marriage is complete unity, without secrets, without shame, without separation of any kind. They were naked and they felt no shame. There was nothing hidden between them. Even in the best of examples of marriages today, uh, that is never always the case. That at some point, you keep thoughts from your spouse because sin creeps up in our minds and our hearts, and... uh, and that's why God works on us. But sin leads to separation. We see in chapter 3, when the serpent came and deceived Eve. Now the serpent, starting in verse 1, was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from, fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman. For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. And the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked. So I hid. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, The woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me, and I ate. You see here that sin pollutes immediately our understanding of relationship, affection, commitment, intimacy. As soon as sin came into the world, relationships were broken. First, their relationship with God. They hid from him. They felt shame. Secondly, When God questioned them about it, they broke with each other. It was the woman's fault. This is what sin does to us, even today. It destroys our relationships. In addition, they were doomed to die. They had separation from God, which eventually led to their physical death. Sin destroys our future. So we have the perfect marriage scene, and then sin enters it. Everything is destroyed. 
And that are, those are the effects that God is working through his redemptive history to correct, to eradicate. Let's turn now to the end of the book. We have, see the bad news there. We have good news at the end. Revelation chapter 19, almost the very end of the book in front of you. So it is 1251. Revelation 19, 6 through 9. Then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of rushing waters and like loud peals of thunder, shouting, Hallelujah, for our Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory, for the wedding of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given her to wear. Fine linen stands for the righteous acts of God's holy people. And the angel said to me, write this, Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. And he added, these are the true words of God. Now that's more like it. We have unity. We have hope. We have joy. That should be encouragement to us as we are discouraged, as we refocus on how we have failed so many times. If you're anything like me, many things pop into mind immediately uh, when we're talking about how we failed uh, our spouse. Uh, But Something else we want to focus on here. God's gift to us of marriage from the very beginning was not simply for our earthly benefit. It was a pattern or copy of his plan to unite all of creation together for his glory so we can enjoy him forever. In that first marriage, there was this future promise, this picture of what the relationship we would have with God at the end of time. Jeffrey Bromley writes, As God made man in his own image... So he made earthly marriage in the image of his own eternal marriage with his people. That's exciting. The Westminster Confession of Faith uh, has something pretty similar. Man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. Is that why people get married? To enjoy each other for the rest of their lives? Uh, Once again, that fairy tale ending. And they lived happily ever for the rest of their lives. That will be the case with us, the church, in Christ. We just have this pesky problem of sin that still pervades our relationships. Fortunately, we have the Word of God that helps us understand our current situation. Having already fallen, having this future before us of being united with Christ, we have work to do now, but the good news is that God helps us in that. So, we are going to be landing mainly in Ephesians, So you can turn towards there now. It's page 1173. Um, Before we get there, uh, we have some verses up on the screen from 2 Corinthians. Just like any marriage today, God requires a sincere and pure devotion from his people. Paul writes to to the Corinthian church, I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy. I promise you to one husband, to Christ, so that I might present you as a pure virgin to him. But I am afraid that just as Eve was deceived by the serpent's cunning, your minds may somehow be led astray from your sincere and pure devotion to Christ. And that is what happens to us today. We allow ourselves to be led away too easily. Going on to verse 4. For if someone comes to you and preaches a Jesus other than the Jesus we preached... Or if you receive a different spirit from the spirit you received, or a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it easily enough. There were people infiltrating the Corinthian church who were turning them away from the true gospel they had been preached. And today we have many such people coming into our lives, claiming to be for our benefit, and actually after us for their own advantage. Skip down to verse 20. Not sure if it's up there, but I'll read it to you. In fact... You even put up with anyone who enslaves you or exploits you or takes advantage of you or puts on airs or slaps you in the face. There were dangers to the church in Corinthian times and Paul has this divine jealousy. Not an envy that is uh, deplorable or to be resented, but a jealousy knowing that the church had a greater good that they were abandoning. It's just like a husband or wife whose spouse starts playing with the idea of, go, of, of leaving, or, um, yeah, just, really just like that, uh, of leaving, being 
uh, deceived and being led out of their relationship. The best good for that spouse would be to stay in that relationship, to be joined uh, with the husband or wife. Um, so, as a husband, um, if my wife said, oh, I'm just going to go to the bar, see what happens. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go live freely this weekend just because I deserve it or something like that. My proper response would be a jealousy. No, your greatest good is to stay with me, to work this together. That's the kind of jealousy that Paul has for the church. So definitely separate that from envy out of, um, out of a sinful heart. That's the kind of jealousy God has for his church. He is the greatest good the church could ever seek. Any one of us individually could ever seek. If he is ultimately good, ultimately loving, ultimately pure, anything else that we try to elevate above Christ would be to our own detriment. It would be to our defeat and ultimately to our death. Let's put it in human terms again. If you were engaged to marry someone... Would you be okay with it if they told you, well, uh, I'll mar marry you and 95% of the time I'll be purely devoted to you, but 5% of the time, say one or two days a month, I'm going to go be with someone else. What was even one time a year? Or even one time in your marriage? I'm going to marry you, but one day in the future I'm going to go be with someone else. Pre-planned premeditated, even though unfortunately experiences like that happen, nobody would go into that willingly and desire that kind of relationship. But yet that is what our sin does to our relationship to God. We have been promised to him, one day we will be united with him, and yet we so often fall away from a devotion to him, a pure, sincere devotion to Christ. You may say, well, Micah, that's all very idealistic, but I am still consistently defeated by my sin. It is not dead. As Paul said himself, oh, wretched man that I am, who will save me from this body of sin? But I want to encourage you in that. You being aware of your sin does not negate the good news, but rather it confirms it. Your awareness of and grief over your sin is a sign that God's Spirit is at work within you. So, take heart. The really good news is coming up. Now we're going to land in Corinthians. Oh, sorry, in Ephesians. Paul wrote Ephesians, and this is a wonderful book to be cherished. It is a summary of what Christ has done for us in the first three chapters, and then it is a uh, summary of how our life should respond to what God has done for us. So, it's looking back. To Christ, it's looking forward to what will be, and in the meantime, how we are to live to honor that truth. So let's start in uh, chapter 1, verses 3 through 10. Read along with me. Um, I'll read it out loud. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the, in the one he loves. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and understanding, he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure which he purposed in Christ, to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. And now there is so much in there that we could take a month to unpack it and still not be done. But look up at verse 4. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. He knows your failings. He knows how you failed yesterday. He knows how you're going to fail tomorrow. But that doesn't undo the choice that he made before the creation of the world. That doesn't undo the plans that he has to fulfill his word by uniting us to him. So even in our deepest failings, we can have encouragement and hope, knowing that 
it is to the praise of his glorious grace that he has freely given us. Our failings, though we should not seek them and follow them out purposefully for this purpose, our failings bring glory to him in how his grace brings us back to purity once more. Let's read 11 through 14 as well. In him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will. In order that we who were the first to put our hope in Christ might be for the praise of his glory. What is the chief end of man? To glorify God. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who was a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession, to the praise of his glory. Remember who was focused on in the marriage supper of the Lamb? It was the Lamb. It was God, what he has done for us. Not the bride, but rather who the bride has become because of his power. That is his plan that he is enacting, and you are part of that plan, and that is an encouragement. So, let's get, uh, let's look at uh, chapter 2. Here we have what God specifically has done for us. We as the bride who were dead, who were without hope in our sin. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work at those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Praise the Lord. So, what is our status? We were dead in our trespasses, in our sins, in our transgressions. He raised us to life. When you're dead, you cannot do anything for yourself. You have no power. We were filthy in our sin. Isaiah 64, 6. Should have put a marker in. All of us have become like one who is unclean. And all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. We all shrivel up like a leaf and like the wind our sins sweep us away. The writer Isaiah does not say even our sins, even our darkest moments are like filthy rags. He says even our righteous acts, those things that we thought were most pleasing, those things that we thought, oh yeah, I did that. I'm, I'm not so, such a bad guy. The scales will weigh out. I will, that one is going to be a, a big heavy weight on the good side to get me into heaven, right? No. Without Christ, apart from Christ and his power, they are like filthy rags. Rubbish. Garbage. But what does he do? Turning back to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians 5, 26. He did what he calls husbands to do. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church, without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. Went from filthy rags to holy and blameless without stain or wrinkle. Radiant. We were naked in our shame. Remember the garden? First thing that happened. Eight. Oh no. We're exposed. He provides the bridal clothes. Let's look closely again at 
Revelation 19, I will read it for you. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory, for the wedding of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. Fine living, bright and clean, was given her to wear. She didn't make it, she didn't provide it for herself, it was given to her by God's works. Fine linen stands for the righteous acts of God's holy people. Aha, Micah, it's what they did. Wait. Turn, let me turn to you. Let me read from you 1 Corinthians 15. Oh, first, Ephesians 2, verse 10. What does it say about the righteous acts? For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. The good acts that are symbolized by the bridal clothes, bright and clean, were given us first to do by God. We cannot take credit for it. He laid it out for us. He planned them for us. In addition, if we look at Paul's writing in 1 Corinthians 15.10, he gives us the power. For I am the least of the apostles and do not even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am and his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them, righteous acts, yet not I, but the grace of God that was within me. The credit doesn't go to Paul. The credit goes to the Holy Spirit who was working through him to do the acts. So we see through this picture the end result we're going to of being pure and spotless before God, being united with the Lamb, is all dependent on work that He does through us. It is not our own works. Our own works cannot undo it. Christ already died. He chose us before the foundation of the world. He chose us before we even sinned. So because we believe, because He has opened our hearts to see the truth, we are predestined to be united with Him for eternity, and that is worth celebrating. Now, how does this impact our daily walk? That's what's important, right? Not just knowing the truth, but applying it to your life. The book of Ephesians, again, I'm high on the book of Ephesians, it's a great book. First three chapters are what Paul has, Paul argues what Christ has done for us. He brings attention. What has Christ done for us? Four through six, second set of three chapters, how do we live in response to that? I encourage you, if you've never sat down and just read through this wonderful book, do that this week. See what jumps out of the page at you. Let's follow his argument of how we're supposed to respond. Just a, a sampling here. Uh, chapter 4, 1 through 6. As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. We'll make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. 5.1 Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us, and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. 15 to 17, be careful then how you live, not as unwise but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore do not be foolish but understand what the Lord's will is and the meat that has stumbled many people and caused a lot of discomfort and is challenging to us today. 22 through 33, because Paul gets down to not just arbitrary, be good in your relationships. He gets specific to our primary human relationships. If God's love and his will for us is impacting us, it should be evident in our first human relationships, which for many of us is our marriage. 21, start there. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word. 
and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In this same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body just as Christ does the church. For we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. Wait a minute, that's what we read in Genesis. But look what Paul makes a claim about that statement. This is a profound mystery. But I am talking about Christ and the church. That statement, man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, was a picture from the very beginning of Christ and his church. This should, again, like I said, challenge us. Our relationships that God gives us are first and foremost meant to be a picture to us, to that person, and to those who are watching that relationship of Christ, what God has done for us. If Christ has saved you, it should be evident in our closest human relationships. So, running out of time, how does this apply? Husbands, are you striving to lead your wife spiritually? What is taking precedence in your life? Do you have a divine jealousy for her soul? When sin starts to creep in, are you trying to push her to Christ? Are you working diligently so that she is daily growing closer to Christ? God gave husbands authority, and with that comes great responsibility, not privilege. I like John Piper's statement here. The husband who plops himself in front of the TV and orders his wife around like a slave has abandoned Christ for Archie Bunker. Christ bound himself with a towel and washed the disciples' feet. If a man wants to be a Christian husband, he must copy Jesus, not Jabba the Hutt. Husbands, are you reading the word in your home? Are you teaching? Do you give the Bible practical authority in your decision making? Is it evident to those that you're in relationship with? Those who looked at your marriage or your parenting, can they see that? Wives, are you submitting to your husband in a way that brings glory to God? Is your relationship with your husband a picture to the world of how the church submits to Christ? If there's a question in your mind of how you're supposed to submit, in what way, there's a lot of debate on that. Think of it that way. That's how Paul puts it. How does the church submit to Christ? That's what he wants wives to do. So that it's a picture to your husband, to your children, and to those looking at your marriage of what Christ has done for the church. That's the goal. Not to get every last ounce of of your rights. Husbands, the same thing. It's not to push. You don't take authority so that you can have your way. We can talk about it a lot longer, but we're out of time. I'm sorry. Uh, About wives and about submission in general. Do not let the culture influence your interpretation of Scripture. Let Scripture interpret culture. Children, are you treating your parents? Are you obeying in a way that brings glory to Christ? And in a way that when others look at you as a child, can see that your respect for your parents is governed by a higher authority. As we are out of time, again, I apologize. I want to just end one more time with looking at that perfect picture at the end. Revelation 19. Hallelujah for our Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory. For the wedding of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given her to wear. Fine linen stands for the righteous acts of God's holy people. The righteous acts that God gives us, the good works that he laid out for us to do, I believe wholeheartedly happen first in our primary relationship. We so often think of them as just doing it for strangers, doing it for less fortunate, people that we don't really have a face for. I think it has to apply to our primary relationship first with your wife. God has given me good works to do for my wife, to wash her according to the word. He has given her good works to do for me. And that lines up with his purpose to unite us all to himself. So let's be mindful of it. Let's look for those things and be aware and pray that God would open our eyes to those examples so that all that we do can be for the glory of Christ. It's a tall order, I know. But remember, God gives us the strength and the avenue to do that through his spirit and through his word. And I believe most importantly through prayer. So let's pray. 
for this and for each other. And not slack in that. Lord, your word can be so challenging, but whenever there's a challenge, there is hope attached to it. There is encouragement. There is joy. You challenge us because you love us. You discipline us. You bring us up because you want to present us to Christ, pure, holy, and blameless. And every day, Lord, you give us opportunity to grow closer to that goal. Let us be aware, help us to be aware of how we can serve those we are in closest relationship to. If we're not able to serve those we are in close relationship to, how can we ever hope to, to serve the needs of those we have no r- real relationship with? Lord, your love and your truth has to pervade every part of our life. Help us in that. Give us the strength. Give us the way. Help us to be diligent, to be in your word and in prayer for our own hearts and for those you have given us to influence. In Jesus' great name we pray into his glory. Amen.